good morning. Today is Tuesday, probably July the 10th. Yes. Good. Yes. Good. This is a microeconomics review class, and we are just beginning to address the material for exam three, which is on perfect competition and monopolistic competition. Um, to put it in perspective in the first place, Everything we cover for exam three will also be on exam four. That's my way of loading the course so that if you do well on exam three, really study hard, it'll help you on exam four and hopefully pull some grades up. Um, that said, the first set of videos on perfect competition, there's about six or seven of them, and the first one is entitled Marginal analysis. And that's because all I do on there is look at the marginal revenue curve, the marginal cost curve, and I do that because that's where we start with every graph for the rest of the term. And we look at these two, and we look at for where they cross, where they intersect. And we call that point alpha. Alpha meaning in the beginning. Okay, everything starts from alpha to omega. So every time, every time you look at, an, at a graph, I want you to get in the habit of locating that point alpha. And then what alpha will tell us is the correct quantity for the firm to produce. Quantity to produce, and this is assuming that they want to maximize Profit. My symbol for profit is pi. Maximum profit I write as pi max. That's our assumption in neoclassical economics, that every business is intending to maximize profit. If you enter the realm of nonprofit enterprise, you get a different set of measurements on how do you want to run your organization. And the interesting thing about nonprofits, in my mind, is that since the 1980s with the Reagan Revolution, there has been a move in this country to reduce the scope of government. And as government scopes have been curtailed, as they have been uh, either defunded or receiving less funding, there has been huge growth in the nonprofit arena. And so we'll take up that as an aside. This whole idea of alpha also relates to your and my personal decisions, or a club, or a marriage, or whatever else. And the fundamental concept is I keep doing stuff, that is, I keep producing stuff, as long as the extra revenue I make is more than the extra cost. And I want to produce in quantity all the way to the point where those two curves intersect. And we'll diagram that for a minute. My point really is if you will look at those first six or seven videos introducing perfect competition, really ingrain those for the rest of the term, with the exception of a little bit of stuff at the end, for the rest of the term, it's the same stuff again and again with just a tweak here and a tweak there. So hopefully we will see grades come up considerably. Can I ask a question? Pardon? Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so I understand that where market, where the, the two graphs intersect, that that's your um, where you're going to maximize your profit. Good. So a couple of the questions on the quizzes, or the question comes up um, about you know um, making as much revenue as you want. Ah, which is different than profit. So yes. But why would a company choose to keep increasing its revenue if it's not making a profit? It wouldn't. Okay. It, 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 you can wind up increasing revenue, but your costs are going up faster. Okay. And that means you've gone beyond that point alpha. So let's just illustrate that for a minute. Um, we can draw marginal revenue first concept. Marginal revenue, the additional revenue that comes in when you sell one more unit. So when you read the marginal revenue curve, it's, oh, unit number 17 made this much money. Unit number 18 made this much money. In the initial 
uh, structure of perfect competition, the marginal revenue curve is going to be flat. And what that is telling you, if the marginal revenue curve is flat, it says that every time you sell something, you get the same extra money. In other words, your price is constant. And for that reason, the marginal revenue th curve is also the same thing as the price line. And the price line is simply another word we use for the demand curve. And another term for the demand curve frequently used in other texts and occasionally referred to here is average revenue. And when this curve is flat, all of those are the same. And we'll start with that assumption just for working purposes. And then against that, we look at the marginal cost. And we recall from chapter 7, the marginal cost curve has a little dip to it, and then it is constantly rising. Well, that's the way the traditional or typical marginal cost curve looks like, and we'll use that, but we'll also use some variations on that. So again, the first thing we look at on every graph is, where's my marginal revenue, where's my marginal cost, where do they intersect? Where they intersect is point alpha. Point alpha tells us the quantity to produce and sell to either maximize your profit or in some short run circumstances to minimize your loss. This is the place to be. This decision is what drives everything else. Now remember what we've done here. We've assumed a flat marginal revenue, but an in increasing upward sloping marginal cost. And that's going to be the assumption behind some of these questions. If you are producing where marginal cost exceeds marginal revenue, where are you on this graph? Where marginal cost exceeds marginal revenue. You are anywhere down in this range of production. Because for any quantity you choose, when you read up, the marginal cost of that unit was greater than the marginal revenue. So the wording of the questions has an implicit assumption about the shape of these curves. You don't go in here. This is called stupid. That means every time I sell one, I make six bucks, but it costs me eight bucks. Rule for that is stupid. Don't do it. Alternatively, if you are back over in this ring, so say you stop right here. You're on unit number 26. What's going on with that unit? When, when we read up, we say, well, it cost me, let me read over here, or it cost me $4.12, but I made $6 on it. I clearly want to produce and sell that. I made a dollar and eight, uh, 88 cents. What about unit number 27? Well, the marginal revenue still exceeds the marginal cost, but by not quite as large an amount. And continue on. Let's say that this is unit number 35. As I move up in my production from 26 to 35, I'm making less money per unit, but I'm still making money, so keep producing. If, and this is, this is where it starts getting important, if I stop producing at unit 26, I'm giving up all this other money I could have made. All of that money, I gave it up. The term I use in that in the videos, and the, the term is specifically formulated this way, I call this foregone profit due to underproduction you are producing less than the amount at point alpha. And there are a number of questions that will be phrased around that concept, and you need to have that image in your mind. This shaded area represents foregone profit if I cut my production at too low a level below 35 up here. So maybe questions will come along and say, if you are producing in the range where marginal revenue exceeds marginal cost, what you, should you do? Expand production, increase production, up to the point where they equal. What's going on where they equal one another, where marginal cost 
equals marginal revenue. This is point alpha. But well, we remember that our point in our definition of marginal cost is included a reasonable profit, an accounting profit. So we want to go all the way out here. There's no economic profit on that unit, but there's an accounting profit, so take it. If we exceed alpha, if we produce more than that and sell it, what happens? When I produce number 36 here, I read up and I say, well, it made me six bucks, but it cost me $6.22. Why would I do that? I wouldn't. If I go all the way out here and I produce 48 units, for example, what have I done to myself? I have lost money on every unit after number 35. Number 36, I lost this amount. Number 37, I lost this amount. Number 38, I lost this amount, and so forth. So if I shade in this entire area out to where I stop production, this triangle represents lost profit, not foregone, lost profit due to making too many of them, due to overproduction. So if I stop short, I have foregone profit. If I go over, I have lost profit. I'm trying to drive everybody back to thinking in terms of every time you see a graph, where's point alpha? This is the first of two steps in all of this graphical analysis. Because the first step tells me how many to produce. The second step is going to say, if I produce that amount, will I make a profit, take a loss, or break even? And that depends on two other curves. It depends on the demand curve and the average total cost curve. And we have to look at those in the second part of the analysis. Okay, so far? So, in this unique circumstance, perfect competition, the demand curve is flat. So it's the same thing as a marginal revenue curve. Let me anticipate ourselves for just a minute. And just without numbers and a lot of detail, just draw kind of a, an overview. Suppose you had what we usually think of as a demand curve shaped like that. When it has a negative slope, it is not the same thing as the marginal revenue curve. We'll see that as we get into monopolistic competition. I'm anticipating or foreshadowing that. But basically, I say, well, if I extended this demand curve out and it crossed the quantity axis at 120 units, if I go back halfway to 60 units, and I come out of the same point of origin up here, that's what my marginal revenue curve is going to look like. It's got a negative slope, but it only goes halfway out. Once you understand the difference in the shape compared to a flat curve, everything else is the same. I still look for point alpha. I said, well, where's my marginal cost curve? Oh, here it is. Well, marginal cost equals marginal revenue right here. That alpha tells me the quantity to produce. Same analysis. Okay, so far? Again, we'll go into that on monopolistic competition. And, and again, I'm just foreshadowing. Just kind of, I mean, this is going to be out there. The next thing I look at is, if I produce that many units, where's my average co total cost curve? If that's my average total cost, and this is my quantity, I can read up and say, well, here's my average cost for every unit I produce. Here's my average revenue. Remember that for price? Here's my average revenue for every unit I produce. I'm making a profit. Hoo ya. Alternatively, what I might find is that my average cost curve is way the hell up here. What does that mean? It means when I pick my magic quantity from alpha, I read up and I say, well, there's the price I'm going to get. But, oh, damn, it costs me too much. That's my average cost. I'm going to lose money. But I am still starting from the same alpha, the same quantity. Step one, find alpha and the quantity. Step two, compare the price to the average cost. 
That's what we will do repeatedly. And now what I'm going to do is back off from this and put it in terms of that flat demand curve, perfect competition. And this is not exactly the way it's presented in the videos. They go through a more sequential nature, but this is, again, sort of a, an overview. Can I erase the board yet? So, we understand the marginal analysis, let's say. Marginal cost, marginal revenue. And we understand that I am dealing in a world we call perfect competition. Now what happens in the traditional microeconomics course is they give you this and they tell you the assumptions behind it and then they start talking. What we are finally beginning to do, at least some of us in the field of economics, is say this is a mythical world. It doesn't exist. We compare everything to this ideal world. But don't start drawing policy conclusions and building new plans based on this, because it doesn't exist. Why? Well, there's four assumptions behind perfect competition that are not really realistic. As we build those assumptions, and we will, we, we build this mythical, and I'm going to use the word mythical, because it, it has a certain connotation. What does it mean when you call something a myth? Not at all true necessarily, if I will. Okay, not necessarily true. And <coughs> if you build your future on assumptions that are myth, you set yourself up for failure. And there are some real problems in this, and I don't mean to imply competition is not good. It's not my point. Competition has very positive benefits for all of us. But it also has some negative benefits that too often in this course, traditionally, we never talked about. But what we're going to do is we're going to talk about these four assumptions, and then we're going to say, well, what if you make the model a little more realistic? Oh, then we get into something called monopolistic competition. This is the second market structure that we're going to study, and it will be on the next exam, just these two. Monopolistic competition. That term, what is a monopoly? What does it mean to have a monopoly on something? You're the only seller, only one seller. But look at this term, monopolistic competition, one seller competition. It's an oxymoron almost. It sounds like two contradictory terms. In fact, what it's referring to is the fact that out of all the companies that are competing, each one's trying to create their own monopoly by violating one of these assumptions. We'll come back to that. Once we finish these two, will we take the next exam? When we come back for exam four, we talk about next oligopoly. What does an olig stem word mean, or root word? Olig means oligarchy. A few. Oligarchy is ruled by a few people. Many people comment in the uh, editorials today that the United States has largely become an oligarchy. We're a relatively few, very rich people manage, control, operate this country. They not only own those few large businesses that have most of the money, they also use that money to buy politicians to get the policies they want. And so this charge of oligarchy in the United States is one that certainly the people on the left take very seriously. Oligopoly, this trailing word here, opoly re refers to sellers. So here we have sales by a very few sellers. We'll get into that. And finally from that, we talk about sales by only a single seller or monopoly. So this is exam one. And this, I'm sorry, exam three, 
And this is exam four, plus a couple of small things. But that's why learning this material now pays you double dividends. Questions, comments so far? OK. As we focus on these two, and especially we focus on the first one, once again, if you get this one down pat, everything else is just an adaptation, a twist, a, a modification. The four assumptions, you'll see those in probably, I think it's the second video. We're going to assume that we have a market with a large number of very small buyers and particularly sellers. We tend to focus on the sellers. This would leave me like, like pet rocks. Okay? Everybody can go out and pick up a load of gravel, paint it a few color, put a card behind it, give it a birth certificate, call it a pet rock. Everybody can be a seller. You can have, imagine, you know what a bazaar is? Anybody ever been to a bazaar overseas, right? You'll have hundreds and hundreds of sellers, many of them selling the same stuff, and you just got to go around and shop between them, you know? Highly competitive, very much to the advantage of the buyer because they're going to beat each other down for price, or they're going to strive to have a better quality, okay? So we like having a market where there's a lot of buyers and sellers. Well, what's going on today in uh, cable TV? What has gone on in the airline air industry? Contraction. Contraction or consolidation. We have gone from very competitive industries with lots of sellers to fewer and fewer and fewer sellers as they have consolidated. Some go out of business, some get bought up. And so we look at airlines today and you've got basically three or four major carriers domestically to use. You look at cable TV, uh, basically well, here in this town we have one choice. Okay. Uh, can you think of anything else that's kind of oligopolistic or very few sellers? How many different soft drinks are there? Pretty much. And, and see, we, we don't ignore all the little ones, but they're so small, they don't make a hell of a lot of difference. Okay. Um, automobiles. I mean, think about it. What's the difference between a, uh, a Chevy S10 and a GMC pickup? Nothing. Nothing. They're just Nothing. brand names. They're, in fact, owned by the same company, General Motors. But as we look around, we see that we may have some different names, but effectively we have very few choices. What happens when you get very few sellers in the market? What do they do? <clears throat> they try to control the market. They collude. They conspire with one another. They fix prices very high or they divide up territories or whatever. So as you get fewer and fewer sellers, there are some advantages, we'll get to them, but there's also some extreme disadvantages for you and me, the consumer. And so our government has an arm, the Department of Justice, who looks at the concentration of sellers. As the industry becomes so concentrated that there's only one or two sellers, and they have on occasion gone into that industry and said, hey, you've got to sell everything off. You've got to break it up. They did that to Bell Telephone. AT&T. That has not been the trend, certainly since the Reagan Revolution, which is very pro-capitalist, pro-market, very much in favor of businesses competing. But in the longer run, what happens when businesses compete? Well, historically, industries have consolidated until some new technological change comes along and destroys the game. So this very large number of very small sellers in particular is one of our assumptions, but it's not very reflective of reality all the time. How many places do you know in Gainesville to go buy new tires for your car? I would say less than 10. In Jacksonville, we have a lot. You have a lot, so you have more choice. You have a perhaps more competitive market. Okay. Second assumption is it's very easy to go into business. Easy entry. By the way, there's also, it's easy to go out of business. So what that means is if somebody comes along with a new idea, a new product, a new service, it's pretty easy to copy it and go into business tomorrow. 
We had that problem in taxidermy when I had a taxidermy business. We would take a young man or a young woman in and we would teach them the art of taxidermy. And it's very much an art. And it's very much a learned skill. It's not something you can do very well by reading a book. And you'd get this person in and they'd be eager and interested and they'd work hard and they would learn and they would learn and they would learn. And after they'd been with you for about three years and they really started to really know the business, they'd open their own store across the street from you. In my partner's case, she had learned. She had spent like 12 years working for a taxidermist and then had a bit of a difference with him and wanted to go out and open her own business. And that's when she and I began to talk about it. But she had signed a non-compete agreement, which is an agreement you sign with your employer that says, I agree that if I quit or I am fired, I cannot start a business to compete with yours within 100 miles or 500 miles or 50 miles. She had signed a non-compete agreement for a 50, 50 mile uh, uh, diameter. Yeah. Maybe no, 50 mile. Radius. radius. I'm trying to think if, if it was designed as radius. Basically what we did, that business was in Hawthorne, out southeast of town, and we opened up in Stark. And I'm not sure there's 50 miles between them, so there might have been a 25 mile radius. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But this is the nature of business, but this is the way we describe it in economics, okay? We prefer, from the consumer's point of view, a highly competitive business where it's really easy to go into business. Businesses hate this. The object of business, I like to say, <clears throat> is if you're in a competitive business, the object of the business is to drive out all the competition, legally, even ethically, until you create a monopoly. Because <clears throat> with a monopoly, you can charge your price. Third assumption, homogeneous products. Homogeneous in this sense means identical in the eyes of the consumer. Now I get into trouble when I use this example, <clears throat> but I'm going to try it anyway. <clears throat> Is 2% milk a homogeneous good? That is, I don't care where you buy it, I don't care what brand name is on it, is it the same wherever you go get it? I have always believed they're the same. When I want 2% milk, I go to the cheapest 2% milk I can find. Because to me, it's all the same. When they're all the same, we sometimes use the word, it's become a commodity. Every unit is the same as every other unit. Something has been commoditized. I would suggest to you, for example, that laptop computers, and I'm getting ready to buy a new one, laptop computers in my mind have become somewhat commoditized. They're all pretty much the same. If you know what you're looking for, you say, this is the one I want, and you can look across the brands, and there they are. They're all pretty much the same, and they're pretty much what? Same price. Okay. If everybody's producing an identically alike good, where would you buy yours? The cheapest. The cheapest. And this assumption is helpful in making us understand why you have to produce at the lowest possible price and lowest possible cost. Okay, otherwise nobody comes to your store to buy. Because there's one other piece of information in here, one other assumption it's very important. It's called perfect information. You and I as buyers know the price that every seller is charging. We've gotten a lot closer to that with the internet. I don't know about you, but when I get, by to, get ready to buy something, I, I first go to Consumer Reports, which I subscribe to, and I read everything about every brand name I can. Then I pick out the brand names I think are suitable to me, and I start going across sellers and comparing prices. You understand what happened 50 years ago? He said, I need a pair of tires. But Bob's place is crowded down the road. I'll go down to Bob's, and maybe I'll call up Pete's, and maybe I'll call up so-and-so, but I, hell, I don't know, you know. 
What else happens when, when, you, when you don't have perfect information? When you roll your car into my mechanic shop and you say, it's making this funny sound. What's going to happen? They charge you. Huh? They charge you. Oh, I'm going to pull in and say, look, I'm going to check it out for free because I really I want, I want your business, okay? And you're going to leave your car with me for 30 minutes. I'm going to get you a Coca-Cola or go across the street and get a sandwich. And when you come back, I'm going to show you the list. What's on the list? Everything I think I can get away with. Do businesses do that? Absolutely. Do all businesses do that? No. But some do. I found them in Gainesville. I'm not going to say it on video, but I can tell you some places to avoid in this town. And this comes, again, a term, let's put it in a different color, a term I like to use to uh, reference the fact when you don't have perfect information, businesses tend, some of them, to prey on ignorance. What does it mean to prey on something? To take advantage of, yes. And then you can say, well, some businesses pray for ignorance, P-R-A-Y, because that's how they're going to make their living. I have a good friend who is a dual certified auto mechanic with 30 years experience. He knows automobiles. His wife took her car into a, a small mechanic shop out of town here, and she came back with a list for $1,200 worth of repairs. And he looked at it, and he said, well, I'm going to look at, at the car. He went out and fixed the car for $34. So that happens. But these are the assumptions we make. You can expect exam questions on what are they, what if you didn't have this, what would happen. If I were giving you a uh, end of course oral exam, I would ask you questions like, explain to me what happens in an industry when there is no longer perfect information. And I would want you to talk to me about how businesses would prey on ignorance. Now, in the Arguments defending competition, what will they tell you? They'll say, well, this is still a good system because as businesses take advantage of your ignorance, what will you do? You'll tell your friends. And as a business's reputation spreads for doing shoddy service, taking advantage of customers, they'll lose business. That's a wonderful theory. And it does occur sometimes. But it does not occur enough, in my mind, to make this a defensible assumption of reality. Okay. Have you ever had a bad time with the business? What did you do about it? Changed businesses. Changed businesses. My friend John Spence, about remember him in the, the Choices paper? John went to a restaurant one night and had absolutely horrible service. No, let me tell you, this, is, this happened to him several times. Let me tell you a better one. He took his laundry over to a laundromat where he tended to drop it off and pick it up. And he was traveling, still does, travels quite a bit. And when he did that, he'd, he'd, drop it, I'm sorry, he'd drop it off at the dry cleaners. Then he'd drop his laundry off at the laundry so they would wash it and fold it. This would be for his suits and stuff. And then he'd go over to a restaurant right next door. All three stores co-located. And it was nice. Drop this off, drop this off, go get breakfast. Pick this up, pick this up, go get breakfast. Very comfortable. And then one day, the dry cleaner who had promised him his clothes the next day <clears throat> didn't have them. And he was flying out of town the next morning. And he said, you failed to keep up your promise to me. You're going to cost me at least one new suit that I've got to go buy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he wrote a letter. And it would basically, I spend about $1,200 a year on your store in dry cleaning. And he says, and I have about nine friends that also deal with your store. I'm going to tell them what's happened to me, and I'm going to ask them not to use your business anymore. My intention is to cost you $10,800, give or take, in revenue next year, and I'm going to pursue this every year for five years. I'm going to try to cost you $54,000 in revenue because of the way you treated me. And then he took a copy of the letter and he said, and he sent one over here and over here, and he said, I'm sorry I can no longer be a you know, customer for your business, but this guy has alienated me to the point that I won't be coming down in this area at all. I'm sorry I won't be a customer at your restaurant. 
That's how you spread the word. That's how you get back. John went to a, a, a hotel out in Phoenix, Arizona a couple of years ago. And he got there, and it was lunchtime, and they had set up this room with reserved tables for supper. And he said, look, I just need a sandwich. Is it okay if I sit here in the dining room, have a quick sandwich, I'll get out of your way? And they said, they can't do that. He got online right then, and within two hours, they had 40 or 50 messages from people saying, my friend John is at your place and says he can't go out. I'm going to spread the word that you people don't have customer service with it. Damn. They don't just give him a table. They gave him a free lunch and comped his room because they recognized how valuable it was. So the, the computer has been helpful about spreading information. It has not been a cure-all. Okay, so again, anticipate questions around that, but the, the heart of the program, the heart of the exam, will come from the graphs, which is why you have many Q1, Q2 quizzes on Canvas. They are all in true-false format. The examination for this course, the final exam, which included all of this, used to have 120 true-false questions. Two hours to do it. That's one minute per question. You better know what you're doing. But I'm telling you that if you can understand the true-false questions of why a question is true, or particularly why a question is false, you'll be able to deal with any multiple choice question you see. That's all multiple choice is anyway. Hey, here's four answers. One of them's true. Same thing. <coughs> so what? <coughs> Pardon me. What you've got to be focused on, let me, let me draw this in better perspective. When we do perfect competition, and I won't drag you through all of it right now, it's on the video, we always start out with two graphs, and it's important you recognize what you're talking about. In the first graph, you're talking about the industry. That means all the sellers, all the competitors, and that has your usual supply and demand curve. And so if a question says, in the XYZ industry, they're talking about this graph. So read the question carefully. This graph basically leads you to an equilibrium price and an equilibrium quantity. And the reasons that it's important is the price translates into the second graph. The second graph is of the firm, a single seller, and they are all hypothesized to be identical. They all have the same curve. And this equilibrium price translates into, for the firm, a perfectly horizontal demand curve. What that means is this is a very tiny firm, one of 10,000 or 20,000. They have such a small share of the market, they have no control over price. Price for them is whatever it is when you get up in the morning. And they produce, they produce between zero and maybe 100 units in an industry that sells two, two million units a day. So they're all very tiny. <clears throat> so they can sell their entire output for the same price. That's a given. When you see that horizontal demand curve, you know it's a marginal revenue curve. You know it's also the price line and the average revenue curve because these three things are always the same thing anyway. When you see that flat curve, you know those four assumptions are at work. You'll have questions like that. Here's the demand curve. What can you tell me about the number of sellers? Very large. What can you tell me about their size? Very small. What can you tell me about information available to the consumer? Perfect. On and on and on. That's the giveaway, perfect competition. Then the graph will include in it a marginal cost curve and an average cost curve. The average cost curve falls. When it hits its minimum point, it's with the intersection of marginal cost, and it climbs, average total cost. And then just in perfect competition, not in the others, but just in perfect competition, you will also see the average variable cost curve, which I'll quickly, immediately draw incorrectly, because it falls, it's a minimum, and then it rises, 
and it too hits its minimum at its intersection with marginal cost. So this is average variable cost. And there is much to be made about those two different curves and what they imply for the firm. But what do we see most of all? The firm takes the price as a given. They don't choose the price. They're told, oh, today the price is right here. Tomorrow the price is down, it's called D1. Tomorrow the price is down here. Next Wednesday the price will be up here. Next Thursday the price will be right here. And you've got to be able to interpret the graph based on the position of the price line, the demand curve. And what, you, what do you do initially with every demand curve? Find alpha. For D2, this is alpha 2. For D1, this is alpha 1. For D4, this is alpha 4. For D3, this is alpha 3. Each of them has a quantity associated with it. And whatever demand curve you're looking at, you want to look down and say, here's the quantity. And at that quantity, what do I have to compare? The price and the average cost to see if I'm making a profit. At Q2, I read up and I say, well, here's price two, but what? How am I doing? When I read up to my average cost, I say, oh, damn. That's my average cost, number two. It's more than my price. It's more than my average revenue. I'm losing money. You see that? At this quantity, find the price from the demand curve, find the average cost from the average cost curve, and see which one's higher. What's going on at D4? Well, I find alpha 4. I read down to Q4. What can you tell me is going on at Q4? When I read up to the price, it's right here, price four. When I read up to the average cost, oh damn, it's right here. Price equals average cost. What's going on with that company? What do we call it? Zero economic profit, positive accounting profit, just enough called break even. Their revenues equal their costs. Break even. What's going on at Alpha 3? Well, here's Alpha 3. I read down to Quantity 3. How am I doing? Quantity 3. Read up to the price. There's D3. There's Price 3. But what's my average cost? right there. Average cost is below the price. I'm making an economic profit. And so you want to be ready to read those curves that quickly. The best way to do that, I think, is practice. And when you, when you think you've got this down pretty good, go to quiz one and quiz two on Canvas. Q1 and Q2. They look identical. They're not. It's to demonstrate to you the wording of the question is key. If the question says, in a competitive firm, you're playing with this graph. If it says, in a competitive industry, you're playing with this graph and those four assumptions. And if you read those questions too quickly, which several people did on the last exam, I have people doing 40 questions in 22 minutes. It's called job security for me. They'll be back next term. Okay? That's the overview I wanted to do today. I want to revisit this in, an, in another review session, and hopefully one or two more, at least during the term. Okay? But if you will watch those videos on perfect competition, read the textbook very closely. If you're still a little uncertain, it takes no effort at all to Google perfect competition on the internet and find plenty of stuff to reread that maybe someone has expressed it a little more clearly. I think it also helps to watch the videos and, you know, replace any 30-second slice or 10-second slice if it's not absolutely clear what I'm saying. When you think you're feeling pretty good about that, do a practice quiz or two on Connect to help. 
when you start to feel kind of cocky and okay, I got this stuff, then try that Q1 and see how you did. Because all the answers are there and some explanations on some of them. If you hit a question that you're not sure on, snip it out, send it to me. Okay? That's pretty much what I had on my agenda for this morning. Angela, you're notorious for coming in here with questions. Do you have any other any questions for so, today? Uh, the only questions I had were I was a bit confused about profit. About profit. Yeah. Okay. And um, so I think one of the questions you've answered, so zero economic profit, break even, and normal accounting profit are all the same thing. All the same thing. Gotcha. Break even, zero economic profit, normal accounting profit. All refer to when the price equals the average total cost. Break even, zero economic profit, or normal accounting profit, ACG, accounting profit. All refer to this condition, or where the demand curve intersects here or here, the average cost curve. Now, in the text, they will talk about a long-run equilibrium for perfect competition. And in the long run, what happens is the average total cost curve is tangent, right here, tangent to the demand curve. And this is what they sometimes call the break-even point. In fact, it is a break-even point. So are these. But this is what happens in the long run. Okay, so far? If you have a situation in the short run where the demand curve is up here, and your marginal cost curves are, here's your alpha, right? Blue is no longer your demand curve. The orange demand curve is what they show you. He said, well, find alpha, and then read for quantity, and then compare price and average cost. What's going on there? They're making an economic profit, right? The price is above average cost. And so then we say, hmm, if this is happening to every company in the industry, how are they doing? What does economic profit mean? It was damn fine. It means I'm coining money. I'm making above a normal return. I'm doing great. Every company's doing great. What's going to happen next? More sellers will come into the market. And so we look back over and we say, well, what's going on over here? Here's the industry. Remember, that's the firm. That's the industry. Here's our current price. So that must be the intersection of supply and demand. And we say, in the short run, at this price, companies are doing great. What will happen next is that other people will say, well, damn, let's go into business. And you'll have an increase in the number of sellers, which is a shift of the supply curve for the industry, which brings the price from here down to here. Now what's going on? Here's your new demand curve. That was number one. Here's demand curve number two. Where's alpha two? Alpha two is right here. How's life? So you're picking the well, your price is below your average cost. <laughs> right? At this quantity, when I read up, I say, here's my price, and oh, here's my average cost. I'm losing money. What'll happen next? If everybody's losing money, what will happen in the industry? Some of the sellers will leave. And as the sellers leave, the supply curve will shift back to the left, S3. All right? We'll call that S2. And as they leave, the price goes up. Where will the price stabilize in the long run? <coughs> It'll stabilize where there's no economic profit to attract more sellers. There's no economic loss, so people go out of business. So it will stabilize in the long run here, wherever that is, 
it will stabilize at this point of tangency. Because at that point of tangency, when that becomes alpha, there's no reason to go out of business. There's no reason to go into business. Long run peak order. Go ahead. So if you give us a graph that looks like that, that doesn't have um, the average variable cost curve on it. No problem. In the sense of, in the long run, is this, co is this industry going to expand or contract? OK. So then the thing to look for is that you're, so you're, you're asking the question about the long run. Because if you were asking a question about the short run, then, then we would carry on. Then the AVC is very important to us in the short run. And I'm, again, I'm going to leave that to you because I don't have time to do it all today. But in the short run, remember, let's just mention it very quickly. You've got an average total cost. You've got an average variable cost. In the long run, you're going to be here, tangent. In the short run, you may be making profit. You may be taking a loss. And then they start asking you this question. If you're taking a loss, should you just close your doors and shut down? That's the key question. And so to identify that, we identify the lowest point on the average variable cost curve, which is where the marginal cost curve goes through, by the way, just to mention that. This lowest point on the ABC is called the shutdown point. And what we're saying is, if your price, your demand curve drops below that, you need to close your business and go fishing. Because if you stay open, you're losing more money than you need to. But if your demand curve is here or anywhere in between here and here, you still stay open in the short run because you're making enough money to cover your variable costs and some of your fixed costs. And that, that particular lesson, litany, whatever, takes a little bit of repetition and thought. But if you go through it a few times, and then once again, once you learn how to read this graph, the rest of them are a piece of cake because they're just variations on a theme. All right, what else? Anybody? So, like in real life, companies. Oh, we don't play in real have... life here. Yeah, okay. Bring that up in some other course. Go ahead. In real life, what? So like they always have an alpha point, like a point where they won't make any more profit after well, a certain point. In real life, we begin to recognize that finding point alpha is sort of a wag, right? A wild ass guess. We kind of guesstimate it. But when we find ourselves doing extra work and not making as much money, we start worrying about it. And when we find ourselves doing extra work and losing money, we say, stop that. Oh. And it's in, in real life, it's they try to measure it. Yes. You know, the accountants get in there with all their cost accounting and the economists with all their theory. But in most small businesses, it's by guessing by God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who's a contractor. He goes in and maybe remodels your kitchen for you. Mm -hmm. And then you come to him and say, you know, I've been thinking about it. Could you also do this? What's his, what's his thinking in our terms? He's going to say, if I do this, how much extra revenue will I make and how much extra cost will it cost me? Mm -hmm. And if he, he says, well, it'll cost this much, and you say, well, I can't pay but this much, what does he do? He says, am I going to make enough money to make it worthwhile? And if the answer is no, then conceptually he's past point alpha, not yes. worth it. Good. Good question. I like actually to talk about reality. I don't particularly like living it all the time. You know, I like talking about it. Okay, what else? We're going to see a lot of like exam two on this test. Like, I mean, I know this is more in depth from like cost and utilities, but like, are we going to see partially the simple stuff on exam three? No, you might have a reference to um, the diseconomies of scale range of average cost. Yes, the question many people missed, which surprised me because it yeah, was. Yeah, I think I did. Okay. Um, you will have uh, certainly some this, when we get into negative slope demand curves and marginal revenue curves, you will be shown the relationship between the marginal revenue curve and elasticity. So you'll need the concepts of elastic, inelastic. 
But as far as specific questions from exam two, no. Yes. I tend to teach this as though each unit is separate and not testable again, but you still got to know the basics. Yes. Okay. Other comments, questions, suggestions? When we, when we get into the second one, monopolistic competition, remember those four assumptions? The assumption about homogeneous goods, everybody selling the same product? That's the assumption we violate or change. We say, what if every company could produce their own unique product? What if we had, and this is the key term, Product differentiation. If a six syllable word. Powerful at a cocktail party. Right? If you have product differentiation, that's what will cause you to see the demand curve for the firm, and that's the only one we play with. The demand curve is no longer flat, it's negative slope. And so the marginal revenue curve, as I showed you at the very beginning, is over here. And once you change that assumption, everything else is the same analysis. Same alpha, same profit measurement, et cetera. But when you get into monopolistic competition and everybody can sell a different product, then you get into reality. How does one company differentiate itself from another? They have a prettier product, they have a prettier sales force, they have a better guarantee, they have a better location. Oh, well now it's beginning to get a little more real. Yeah, a little bit. <clears throat> the questions that you gave us, um, that kind of the discussion questions. Um, Remind me what they were. Uh, so like when a market is not perfectly competitive, how does that impact buyers and sellers? Were mm -hmm. they just things for us to kind of think about? I mean, you won't be asking for free responses. I won't be asking for free responses on the exam, no. That's just the concept behind it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. To help you as you hit some of these questions, maybe think a little more creatively about what it's asking. Yes. I uh, will say that, that on exam two, having I have gone over a number of examinations, many of them from students who did very well on exam one, the most common thing I saw was that people took the, the test in a hurry and didn't pay attention to the detail. And as I have talked with a few students about, well, here's a question that you missed, the single most 90% response is, Oh, damn, I knew that. Yes, you did, but you read it in a hurry. You have got to pick these questions apart word by word. You've got to parse them, right? When you take, when you take that uh, practice quiz on Canvas Q1 and Q2, you'll begin to see what I'm talking about. Take your time. Okay. At some point, are you going to um, show us that what you did for the Excel sheet where I did not realize I hadn't sent that out to you until I read my email from a student this morning, and I will be sending those out this afternoon. I have, I have meetings up till about 1.30 or 2 o'clock. How is it possible to average our grade? Because like, like me, for example... Don't average it numerically. That's the last thing I do. <sighs> I look at your letter grades, and I look for a pattern. If I see a pretty clear pattern, boom, there's your grade. Yes. If I see, God, you got two B's and two C's, I go in and look and say, were those high B's or low C's? Low B's. Were those high C's or low C's? Oh, those were high C's and two B. B. Yes. Okay. If I still can't make sense out of it, I'm going to look at those, and then I'm going to go to your Connect records and say, did you do all your Learn Smarts? Submit them on time? Did you do at least six practice quizzes for every chapter well before leading up to the exam, not all the last day. How did you do on them? Oh, you really made an effort at it. Two Bs, two Cs, B. Too often what I find is, oh, did one practice quiz per chapter. Two Bs, two Cs, C. Not enough effort. Yes. That's pretty much it. 
And I used to facetiously say that all I do is look down the roster and go, like them, don't like them, like them, don't like them. <laughs> but I don't know you well enough with an yes, online or a hybrid course to be able to do that, so no problem. Yes, I was just wondering, because like, I did decent on the first one, but the second one, I thought I did good, but I did not do good at all. Well, exam like, three oh, and exam gosh. four are designed that if you really do well on exam three, it'll carry you through a lot of exam four, plus make it easier to learn the new material. And you should, if you started high, drop, these should start coming up. Yeah, should. Yes. Anybody else, anything? Overwhelmed with students and questions here this morning, right? Oh, I have another question. Sure. All right, so on Connect, yeah. you have that the assignments are due on a date, yeah. but it's 12 a.m. And I was thinking I was going to do it that day and the other day because I, I worked all week and I was like, okay, I have this day to do it. Nope, it was due like technically on the 5th mm -hmm. at 11.59. Uh, but it said that it was due on the 6th. Usually if I if I have said it at 12 a.m., it's, it's it's an accident on my part. If you'll email me what you sign up for. on 12 a.m. <laughs> really? Then it was intended to be 11.59. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, and I was like, oh, my gosh. I was like, well, it's like, I mean, I did it anyways. I still did it that day, but I was like, right. Well, it happens. It happens. Does it still so it still does, but it's like, it's no. not for a grade. But he doesn't grade it anyways. But but still, it says that it's past due. But it says that it's due on, like like this previous one. It no. says it was due on the 6th. No, what you're saying is practice quizzes, not learn smart. No, sir, no, sir. The learn smart, learn smart? itself. Yes, sir. And it will still let you turn it in late? Yes, sir. Okay. What yes. will happen if I, if your grade's borderline and I go back and look at your records, I will look down and say, oh, you did that one late, but I will look at the date. Yes, sir. And if you turned it in like the next day, that, that, that's I'm still going to, you know, that's going to be, still be to your favor, not against you. Yes, sir. Yeah, because it, it says that it's due, uh, like this one was 7, 6 at 12. And I just looked at the 12, I was thinking, okay, like maybe 12, 12 p.m., yeah, 12 noon. Um, so I just wasn't the, thinking about it. That's the chapter it. reading. Yes. It's not the quizzes. It's yes. just, no, no. It's just yeah, the, it's the chapter. So you've got to, you know, on each chapter. The learn smart. Right. Yeah. Do it the day before it says it's due, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> if you're going to turn it in a day late, I'm going to try to remember to check that as I see that you were late. Yes. And if you're only late on one or two, it's not going to hurt you anyway. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. It was just, it was just chapter eight. Cool. Like, cool. Oh. As long as you're good on the other ones, or when you blink an eye. Yes, sir. Good. Anything else? Okay, we're done. Bye.